The day the world ended, in Cat's Cradle. For maybe a hundred thousand years or more, grown-ups have been waving tangles of string in their children's faces. Um, Newt remained curled in the chair. He held out his painty hands as though a cat's cradle were strung between them. No wonder kids grow up crazy. A cat's cradle is nothing but a bunch of X's between somebody's hands, and little kids look and look and look at all those X's. And no damn cat and no damn cradle. So goes a conversation between the narrator of Cat's Cradle and the son of a scientist who created the ill-fated molecular material known as Ice-9, a structure of water that has the power to instantly solidify water to catastrophic ends. With that in mind, join us today as we ponder the future of technology, world-ending discoveries, and what it means to have, well, no meaning at all in Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Cat's Cradle. I'm your host, Zach. Now please, sit back and enjoy today's edition of Lit Tips. Cat's Cradle is a cautionary tale that spells doom for humanity when the lust for technology advancement threatens to solidify every lake, ocean, and river instantly into ice. But to truly understand the nuance and fears explored in Cat's Cradle, it's a good idea to have some context for the 1960s and post-World War II era in general. Let's venture back to when Cat's Cradle was first published. In 1964, Kurt Vonnegut published his fourth novel as a hardcover with the large publisher Holt Reinhardt and Winston. Now imagine, it's the height of the Cold War, and tensions between the US and Soviet Union are at a breaking point. Still fresh in the American zeitgeist, is the Bay of Pigs fiasco, a failed invasion and coup attempt where American intelligence officers trained anti-Castro Cuban guerrillas who subsequently launched an invasion on the Cuban mainland. The hope was that a young president would crack under pressure and provide air support for the half-baked operation. He didn't. This was the unfolding world stage as Vonnegut set out to write his second novel, which languished for years and would later become Cat's Cradle. The concept of universal truth was utterly diminished in favor of propaganda and patriotism that had been fermenting since World War II. Similar to one of his influences, Mark Twain, Kurt Vonnegut was a master of satire. However, he never appreciated the label black humorist. In Studies in American Humor, Peter C. Coons and Robert T. Talley Jr. writes Vonnegut makes sense through humor, which is, in the author's view, as valid a means of mapping this crazy world as any other strategies. And Vonnegut does exactly that by using humor as a device to explore and make palatable the cold truths and bleak outlook he envisions for humanity. Cat's Cradle is split into two major parts and contains 127 discrete chapters. The novel itself is short, and Vonnegut has claimed that his books are essentially mosaics made up of a whole bunch of tiny little chips and each chip is a joke. The first is set in Ilium, New York, where the narrator introduces himself, Call Me Jonah, which is reminiscent of Herman Melville's Moby Dick, Call Me Ishmael opening. Both characters are not only narrators, but protagonists of their own stories. Jonah tells his story as a flashback when he was a professional writer working on a book about what significant Americans did on the day of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima entitled The Day the World Ended. One of his intended subjects is one of the deceased fathers of the atomic bomb, the fictional Dr. Felix Honecker, who's also a Nobel laureate physicist. Honecker was working on a substance for a marine general that would solidify mud so soldiers could run across it more easily when he discovered Ice-9. Ironically, this, like the atomic bomb, is a potentially catastrophic substance with capabilities to destroy all life on Earth. Although with the serendipitous nature Vonnegut is known for, Felix Honecker dies in his rocking chair while taking a break experimenting with his recent discovery. Vonnegut based Felix Honecker on his experiences with aging scientists he interviewed while working in the public relations department for General Electric's research company. Vonnegut found that many of the aging scientists had no concern for how their research might be used. For instance, let's take the Nobel Prize winning chemist Irving Langmuir. According to Vonnegut, was absolutely indifferent to the uses that might be made of the truths he dug out of the rock and handed out to whoever was around, but any truth he found was beautiful in its own right, and he didn't give a damn who got it next. 
Langmuir became the key inspiration behind Vonnegut's Felix Honecker, even down to the similarly named Ice-9, which Langmuir worked on to seed ice crystals that would increase or diminish rain and storms. Honecker's three unusual children, Frank, Angela, and Newt, find the Ice-9 and split it up between themselves. It is through the desire to learn more about Felix Honecker for his book that Jonah meets his children and eventually learns of Ice-9. Frank is the eldest son and is technically minded for better or worse. Angela is a clarinetist and abnormally tall while the youngest sibling, Newt, is unusually short and is an artist who specializes in painting minimalist abstract works. It's Newt who describes what his father was doing as the bombs dropped. He recounts that his father did nothing more than play a string game, known as Cat's Cradle. The second part of the novel takes place in the fictional Caribbean island of San Lorenzo. Jonah receives a magazine assignment that takes him to the Rocky Island Nation, one of the poorest countries on Earth, with only one city, Boulevard. However, it does possess fighter jets if that gives any indication of where its disparities begin. San Lorenzo is ruled by a Christian government along with a dictator, Papa Manzano, who is an American ally and staunch opponent of communism. San Lorenzo is an interesting portrait of what Western nations, led by the US, wreak on the developing world. It has a stooge government and leader that's entirely beholden to the US, and a suffering people that are highly reminiscent of Cuba, Guatemala, and the other nations exploited by Western business interests. For his fictional island, Vonnegut injects Western influence in the most humorous of ways. Just imagine a national anthem that sounds fairly identical to Home on the Range, and a flag that has the US Marine Corps corporal chevrons on a blue shield, or a currency that's called corporals. Even more interesting is the founding of San Lorenzo. US Marine Corporal Earl McCabe deserted his company in 1922 when he was shipwrecked on an island along with his accomplice, Lionel Boyd Johnson, who is from Tobago. After the duo set in place a series of events that booted out the San Lorenzo's governing sugar company, it became a republic. Those circumstances didn't get any better for the citizens of San Lorenzo. Due to the rampant exploitation of the island's inhabitants, the only plausible remedy to maintain some form of purpose in the face of poverty and squalor was in the form of a religion. But not just any religion. Boyd Johnson created a religion known as Bokanonism. Bokanonism is a semi-humorous religion based on enjoying life through believing FOMA, or harmless lies, and taking any bit of encouragement where you can. Boyd Johnson assumed the new identity as Bokanon, and decided that Bokanonism should be outlawed in order to help it spread quicker. The punishment if caught practice in Bokanonism involves impalement on a hook, which is not only grisly, but sounds a little familiar. To sell the entire thing, Bokanon exiles himself and dwells in San Lorenzo's jungles as the father of Bokanonism. Papa Manzano was once Earl McCabe's right-hand man, and his intended successor after he died. Even though Papa Manzano purports Christian values, he too is actually a devout follower of Bokanonism, as well as the other leaders of San Lorenzo. Many of the sacred texts that make up the religion are called the Books of Bokanon, and are written in the form of Calypso songs. Calypso music found its origins in the 17th century, brought by African slaves forced to toil the sugar plantations. With no connections of their homelands, and unable to interact with one another, Calypsos were used to mock the slave masters and communicate with one another. It's only prescient that Vonnegut would use this form of music to become the to become the dying gasps of humanity, brought on by Western expansion and exploitation. Theodore Sturgeon once described Cat's Cradle as appalling, hilarious, shocking, and infuriating, concluding that this is an annoying book and you must read it. And you better take it lightly because if you don't, you'll go off weeping and shoot yourself. Even the way that the world ends transpires under the most absurd scenario. Felix Honecker's son, Frank, also happens to be a major general of San Lorenzo and a close confidant of Papa Manzano's. And the terminal old dictator, who's dying of cancer, wants Frank to succeed him. But Frank has no desire to lead and pleads with Jonah to take his place as the leader of San Lorenzo. 
At this, the ever apt Newt echoes his thoughts on the cat's cradle, again implying how the game with its invisible cat is an appropriate symbol for the nonsense and meaninglessness of life. Jonah reluctantly accepts, mostly because it means that he would wed the old dictator's beautiful adopted daughter, Mona. Meanwhile, the bedridden Papa Manzano, in the spirit of Bokanonism, swallows a fragment of Ice-9, committing suicide by turning to solid ice. It turns out that Frank once gave Papa Manzano just a fragment of Ice-9. Remember when we mentioned scientists like Irving Langmuir who don't consider the outcome of their findings? Well, in a bizarre series of events, one of the island's fighter jets crashes into the seaside palace during Jonah's inauguration ceremony, casting Papa Manzano's body into the ocean. Immediately, all of the planet's bodies of water freeze over, which spells disaster as super tornadoes sweep over the land, ravaging the rest of the Earth. Only a few people like Jonah and the Honeckers escape to the bunker, but in the end, they're left with imagining creative ways to meet their doom. After the worldwide fallout, Newt mentions maybe he could find a neat way to die. Jonah recalls a dream about climbing Mount McCabe, but doesn't know what to take with him. Then spies Bokanon sitting on the side of the road, writing the last sentence of the books of Bokanon. It reads, If I were a younger man, I would write a history of human stupidity, and I would climb to the top of Mount McCabe, and lie down on my back with my history for a pillow and I would take from the ground some of the blue-white poison that makes statues of men, and I would make a statue of myself, lying on my back, grinning horribly, and thumbing my nose at you-know-who. We hope that you enjoyed this edition of Lit Tips. As always, hit that like button if you like what we're doing, subscribe for more videos on literature from your favorites to the plain obscure, hit that bell if you want to be notified when videos drop, and leave a comment with your thoughts on this video, along with suggestions for any books or authors you would like us to cover in future episodes. Until next time, keep reading.